Um, we are now moving into the next section of our program, which will include two keynote speakers. Uh, one is here with us in person. One, unfortunately, had a flight cancellation and will appear virtually, um, followed by a fireside chat. So our next keynote speaker is Rituparna Bora. Rituparna is a queer, disabled, indigenous feminist activist from India with over 18 years in advocating for LGBTQIA plus rights. She is the co-founder and executive director of Nazaria, a queer feminist resource group in India. She also serves as an advisory board member for Outright International's LBQ Connect program, as well as Rainbow Lit Fest and Sa uh, Sahayog. She was featured in the UN Free and Equal Campaign on International Women's Day 2022 as a veteran LGBT human rights defender and was also a co-petitioner in the marriage equality case in the Supreme Court of India. Ritu, over to you. Well, uh, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, some of the things that I'm going to, um, okay, my pronouns are she and her. Some of the things that I'm going to read out to you might be very triggering. So I'm just telling you because our lives are not, um, our lives are triggering and our lives are full of violence. And as a lesbian woman, uh, I have to give you this warning. Uh, so I want to start this talk with some real life quotes uh, from LBQ persons who came to this um, uh, uh, a closed door public hearing um, held by the National Network for LBI Women and Trans Persons um, in New Delhi, India. And Nazaria is part of, um, Nazaria, our organization is part of this uh, network. And the and sad and the funny thing is that India is such a big country and there are so many LGBTQI groups. There are only six queer feminist groups that are working for LBQ persons. That's really funny and that's really interesting because we work with a queer feminist agenda. Um, so here I quote, this one time during Diwali, Diwali is a festival, there was a huge fight about me. They decided we will kill her today. Papa had a red poison bottle. Mother and brother, brother had caught hold of my legs and hands. Younger brother was looking at me. There was no one to stand up for me. I kept praying that if I survived today, I would leave. I did not uh, want to stay with these people. Quote, un quote closed. The casualness with which Lekha, the uh, name change, is told that she causes so much tension, she might as well die, it caused the brutality inherent in many other test, uh, testimonies. The second quote, when I was in school, my father's friend molested me and my father said it's because of how I behave, quote end. The third quote, the man of my family took me to a bed and my father abused me. He came with a knife to kill me and an uncle said that he will buy poison so I die. The uncle said, if you need to experience the pleasure of a man, I am there. <coughs> These are LBQ persons. Their age will be between 19 to 20, 24 years from different corners of the world and their fault, the gender identity and sexual orientation. 31 LBQT persons spoke about familial, natal, natal or families assigned at word violence in a very closed door hearing in Delhi where eight a very renowned um, civil rights uh, activist and academicians heard this, um, this um, their their tes testimonies, where a report was published called "Our Own Hurt Us the Most." The report will be uh, uh, will be pasted in the Zoom thing by one of our friends. The, uh, in April 2023, this year, the the Supreme Court of India was ready to hear 20 plus petitions for marriage equality. However, unlike what the larger society thinks that thus far acceptable ways of forming socially and legal, uh, legally legible societies are either through birth or adoption or by marriage, the petitions were also asking for right to marry. And in this context, we, the queer feminists, the perverts, 
the network, we thought um, we wanted to file a petition. We wanted people to write, also to have the choice to write to marry, but we also feel that we also write to have a for, right to form families beyond right to marry. This petition came at a time when questions around who can be family and whether adult citizens of this country can have a right in forming their families and intimacies. Therefore, we em emphasize the right to form family with or without marriage. And more in importantly, because we, have, uh, we were coming from the point of view of LBQ persons, right to protection from natal family violence and the right to nominate anyone from the chosen family in matters of life, health, and death. <clears throat> the 20 other petitions did not highlight the tight control of parents, families, or by extension that LBQ communities or persons face. That is, or also talk, did, did, did not talk about forced or early marriage, which is, which is very common in our country. And, and forced, or, forced or early marriage happens uh, at the age of 14, even before you can actually talk about your sexuality or your gender identity. You are just married because you are female assigned at birth. Um, so, and, and most of the petitions, all the petitions actually spoke about how the parents were very accepting. And we were like, no, for LPQ persons, this is not the case. And, and, and this is not the case of only India. Globally, we have seen reports where LBQ persons have faced severe violence. Um, and, and, the, and, and the people who came and talked about the, the, uh, the, gave the testimonies also spoke about how the parents, along with the police and the mental health institutions and the courts, they all came together to, to actually violate their rights. Some of them were kept in mental health asylums. Some of them were kept detained in jails. Uh, there was a case where one person was actually uh, raped by the husband because, because they were married off at an early age, continuously raped by the mm, uh, husband until unless they managed to escape, but they were kept in the mental health, mental health asylum and given, given shock treatment. Um, so now we, we, we understand that. Now I'll coming to the fact that, sorry, um, yeah, these are very triggering uh, discussions. Um, and uh, this is a, I remember, so while growing up as a child and in schools and parents and relatives would always talk about how blood is thicker than water and how, how our friends will ruin our lives and we should choose our friends very carefully and we should not go out with our friends. Um, and unconsciously, somehow we have we have felt that maybe our families come first, and and therefore somehow we feel that our friends are so when when whenever we fall in love or uh, find romantic sexual partners, um, the the friends come next. So whenever a breakup happens, we we tend to go to our chosen families, our friends, then. We come back to our romantic sexual partners, and then a breakup happens, and again we go back to our friends. And but we forget that in our lives, in especially in queer lives, and and chosen families have been founded by queer people, uh, especially when HIV uh, uh, discourse happened, and especially when lesbian violence happened. That how chosen families supported us in many many ways, and still supports us. Um, so, so yeah, and the recognition of this chosen family will actually be a challenge to hetero patriarchal nature of the state, which has always recognized the binary of cis-set family system. Even the recognition of uh, same-sex marriage is in the binary of um, this heteropatriarchal family system. So if you get the recognition of the chosen family, it is actually a challenge to the whole idea of how a family is perceived by the state, uh, by the state. And then who can visit you in the ICU and who can be your nominee, who can actually um, adopt and look after the babies. 
or if you want babies or or your cats or your dogs so it's <laughs> so it's very important that as square people while we ask for marriage um equal uh, equality we also ask for the recognition of this chosen family because the reason we are we are queer is that we challenge the set norms of the society um acceptance of our chosen families also give out a strong message to the society and the state that no matter you try to hurt us uh, your archaic institutions of it and your comments this recognition would mean that we will fight back because my people are with me and i'm going to quote a beautiful quote from midnight children a found family is every bit as beautiful as a born family even more so perhaps stories are about choices after all and to choose a choose to be a family is a wonderful a story as can be told now coming to the marriage equality petition on 17th of october we got a judgment and um, so so we had a five judge bench and two of the judges including the chief justice wanted us to give us marriage equality N no not marriage equality he wanted to give us civil union and also ad adoption rights but the three other judges which is called the majority judgment did not want to give us any of the rights um no no civil union no adoption because they thought that it is the right of the uh, parliament to decide on um, if we should get those rights and all therefore the majority opinion was totally against it and we did not get marriage equality or civil union or 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 um, or adoption rights but we got uh, what we got because of the petition we filed is that they recognized that um, queer uh, people queer couples face violence from the families they recognize natal family violence they recognize um, and they said in their words the state is also bound to afford them full protection of law in case these rights are in peril this is about queer couples they also men mentioned two other judgments which categorically talk about state sponsored shelter homes for queer couples if they face familial violence or societal violence so this coming from the apex court is was huge for us that even though we did not have marriage union or you know civil union or marriage equality but they recognize the fact that natal family violence happens and family uh, family is not the topmost uh, institution to be respected and family is the first place where violence happens um and 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 this was a big win for our queer feminist move organizing because we have been fighting for gender based violence a lot now coming to the government the government lawyer opposed had opposed the petitions since from the beginning and uh, we have no hope as such but the but the supreme court said that you have a timeline and you have to form a committee and you have to see uh, what uh, what rights you can give and you if you should pass the marriage equality petition or not the review petitions are in the court <clears throat> one thing that i have uh, but but one thing that happened is that as soon as the marriage equality petition uh, the news came in the media highlighted no same sex marriage in india without highlighting the fact that we have still protection orders so the, because the media high, highlighted this and nazaria runs a helpline we started getting calls from ldq people saying that oh we fa we have been facing so much violence we are waiting for the judgment to come and now we can't run away from a fam from the family so we have now started advocating saying that you can we have protection so just run away we'll help you and we have done that recently like many cases in the high court just last last para ldq activists have have often been invisibilized or they do not fit, fit the funders framework focused on either women's rights or lgbtq rights for example dom domestic violence um funders will not fund violence against queer people you look know, queer women lgbtq women and or or lgbtq funders will not fund what lgbtq women are facing we are and also the reason is that we are intersectional 
we work on marginalizations within marginalizations. We are feminist and we work on various movements. We, we do not just work on being LGBT and who, who do we sleep with. And we are always present in various progressive movements. However, it is high time that our voices are being heard, not just as part of the larger LGBTQI spectrum. We just want, don't want to be an etc. We, we are really tired of being an etc. in the women's movement. And we are now tired of being an etc. in the LGBTQI plus uh, spectrum. But as a group, which has always been invisibilized, but it's long enough and we need to be heard loud and clear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ritu, for those powerful remarks and for that call to action. We're going to bring Ritu Parna back up to the stage in a few minutes, but we also have an additional keynote um, uh, right now. Um, then our next keynote speaker is Kimberly Zieselman, who unfortunately couldn't be with us in person today because of a canceled flight. Um, but we're so happy that she's able to join us virtually and continue this conversation about those who are marginalized within our own communities. Kimberly Zieselman is, is an intersex woman, lawyer, and human rights advocate with more than 25 ex years of experience in nonprofit leadership, and she just joined Outright as Senior Advisor for Intersex Global Rights. Previously, she served as Senior Advisor to the Special Envoy to Advance the Human Rights of LGBTQI plus persons at the US State Department, and was the Executive Director of Interact, Advocates for Intersex Youth, the premier US intersex policy organization. She was also on the Board of Directors for Interconnect, the largest intersex support group in the United States. Kimberly is an official signatory to the historic Yogyakarta Principles Plus 10 and the author of XOXY, an award-winning memoir about her personal and professional intersex journey. And she's the narrative, she's the executive producer of an award-winning short narrative film, Comment as Red Hair, currently screening at festivals and which some of you saw our screening of last night. Kimberly, welcome to Out Summit and welcome to Outright. Thank you, Neela. Thanks, everyone. Um, as Neela said, my flight was canceled, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would be there with you all in person. But I am happy to be here virtually as an intersex woman and a human rights defender and a new outright team member. Um, so I want to start with a definition of a word that I don't think I've even heard yet this morning, and that is intersex. Um, intersex defines someone like myself who's born with one or more sex characteristics, that is genitals, reproductive organs, chromosomes, or hormones, that do not align with what is typically considered as either a male or a female body. Nearly 2% of the population, as common as people born with red hair or green eyes, and more common than identical twins, and equal to the entire population of Mexico, which is about 136 million people. It can be apparent immediately at birth or realized later in childhood or adolescence or even adulthood. And it's important to note that intersex is not a gender identity or a sexual orientation and not the same as transgender. However, intersex people have a variety of sexual orientations and gender identities and some of course may also be trans. So as I said, intersex is really not that rare but it has been largely invisible due to the shame and the stigma and widespread erasure in society. The key issues for our community include irreversible and unnecessary infant and childhood surgeries as a form of gender-based violence, a lack of access to intersex affirming care, healthcare across the lifespan, legal recognition and self-determined gender recognition, and in some places, sadly, infanticide. So today I'd mostly like to focus on the biggest issue our community faces, which is the violation of the human rights of infants and children born with intersex traits, particularly the harmful medical interventions. About one in 2000 intersex babies around the world are born with a visible physical genital difference, making them the most vulnerable to early harmful surgeries to quote, normalize their otherwise healthy bodies. For example, when an intersex baby is born, 
their genitals may not appear to be what is typically expected for either a boy or a girl. Despite being perfectly healthy, doctors urge conf often confused and emotionally vulnerable parents to consent to irreversible infant surgeries to normalize their baby's genitals. And sometimes parents themselves will aggressively seek out medical intervention in an attempt to fix their intersex child. We have much evidence of harms of performing these surgeries on intersex infants and children without their con informed consent, which includes pain, nerve damage, loss of sensitivity, scarring, incontinence, and even sterilization, as well as high incidence of PTSD and an increased risk of suicide. And of course, the risk of sex assigned will not match one's gender identity. These unconsented medical practices on infants and children are similar when you think about it to so-called conversion therapy that is done to children. Most medically unnecessary surgeries irreversibly alter an intersex child's body with the consent of their parents. And I have to note here, it's often, most often not fully informed consent of the urging of so-called professionals in an attempt really to erase their intersex traits. So since the 90s, there's been a growing global, global movement to end such harmful practices and raise awareness about the existence of intersex persons while also recognizing their human rights to self-identify both their sex and their gender and be legally recognized under the law. Unfortunately, the movement has been woefully underfunded there is an enormous need for resources and capacity building assistance from donors and allies, including in other related movements. Currently less than 2% of all LGBTQI plus funding goes to specific intersex led work. While an increasing number of LGBTQ plus organizations are claiming to do intersex work, in reality, many are barely scratching the surface while Outright has been inclusive of intersex work at some level over the last at least decade, I'm honored to be joining the team to help move their support of the global movement forward in new and exciting ways while working directly with the communities on the ground in the global South, East and beyond. I think it's really important to point out that like so many movements, the intersex movement is very intersectional and can benefit from allyship and collaboration from other related movements, including children's rights, reproductive rights, anti-violence movements, including ending FGMC and even disability rights. This is not just an LGBTQI plus or queer issue. While intersex persons routinely face discrimination, violence and harmful practices based on others' fear of difference, in our case, physical bodily differences, thus aligning our movement in many ways with LGBTQ+. Intersex is also unique and different in some important ways, particularly regarding these harmful irreversible surgeries that are done to us as infants and young children, again, without our consent. In some cases, we're labeled intersex, disordered, defective, and something to be fixed or erased as soon as we enter the world. And before we can even say our first words to express any sort of identity at all. The key difference in experience, this key difference in experience provides several layers of complexity pertaining to issues, including parental consent and children's rights, similar in ways I think to the disability rights movement, but that deserves more attention and collaboration than has been happening in the intersex movement to date. So when we talk about movement resourcing for the intersex community, I believe it just it cannot just be within the context of LGBTQI plus human rights, but also in the context of these other human rights frameworks. As we all know, the transgender community has been specifically under attack, attack and there are increasing movement challenges in general fueled by anti-trans and anti-gender forces, if you will. I think it's important to understand and acknowledge both the similarities and the differences between the trans and the intersex movements. But most importantly, at the core is the similar fight for bodily autonomy, period. It is in some ways really as simple as that. 
And let's include women in general in this fight for bodily autonomy. Women, transgender, and intersex people are all being attacked and denied the most basic of all human rights. However, there are also differences that can make collaborative advocacy tricky at times. For example, here in the United States, there has been a wave of state level legislation and new laws banning health professionals from providing gender affirming care to transgender youth. However, most of these laws have explicit written exceptions, allowing doctors to provide hormones and surgical intervention on infants and young intersex children without their consent in an effort to fix their disordered and non-binary bodies. So while the trans community is advocating for gender affirming care that involves parents and doctors and aims to keep the government out of the examining room, out of the surgical operating rooms, the intersex community is advocating for the government to step in and limit some of the very same procedures on intersex infants and children who have not expressed any desire for such intervention. And in most cases, as I said, are too young to talk. So while both movements at the core are indeed fighting for bodily autonomy, in many ways they are seeking uh, medical intervention and what they are seeking, the medical intervention is completely opposite and at odds with one, with one another when they're advocating. So this is further confusing when, when many of the same transgender affirming medical professionals are themselves also at the same time doing harmful surgeries on intersex children. And I think that's worth repeating. Many of the same transgender affirming medical providers who are allies to the transgender community are at the same time doing harmful surgeries on intersex kids. So I, I, I strongly believe that there needs to be a combination of more, you know, behind the scenes collaboration between our movements and outward support between the intersex and trans movements, as well as a joint articulated focus on bodily autonomy as the ultimate goal. As we've heard a bit here already this morning, there is a need for strong collaboration in encountering the increasingly powerful anti-LGBTQ plus and so-called anti-gender movement. Um, but as I mentioned at the top, I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that even here today already in this group, intersex has been pretty much left out of the discussion and often not included when the acronym is mentioned. So we have our movement has work to do. Um, I'd like to end on a hopeful note. Um, first, Outright just hired a senior advisor in global intersex rights, so yay. Um, I'm really excited about that. Um, more to come. And despite the many challenges we are in fact facing globally in our collective movement, intersex rights are gaining some traction around the globe. For example, in just the last you know, year and a half, or so, three more countries have banned surgeries, banned surgeries on intersex infants and children. In Greece, activists were successful in passing, passing a criminal law, for example, against medical professionals who perform such practices to children under the age of 15. Kenya has not only included intersex people in their national census, but also has amended their Children's Rights Act to protect intersex children from harmful, medically unnecessary surgeries. Given the fierce anti-LGBTQ movement in East Africa, it is not surprising to learn that this intersex advocacy work was done mostly outside of the queer framework with a focus on children's rights. And I believe that this really underscores the necessity of all of us taking the lead from the community on the ground in any given country or region and understanding what will work and what won't. Um, finally, recently in uh, Spain passed a law protecting intersex children while also giving intersex and trans and other persons the right to self-identify. These are all promising signs of advancement during what I, would, what I think is an otherwise pretty dark time for LGBTQI plus rights. So in closing, um, I think I'd like to just make a pitch for everyone listening to be more open-minded and inclusive about advocating for the rights of intersex persons, both within and outside queer movement frameworks. Um, intersex people, while it, the existence of intersex people can really help provide objective proof against the assumed natural binary 
proof that is beneficial to the broader, more inclusive gender movement. Our still mostly hidden community desperately needs allyship and support as we pursue the same human rights that we all deserve. I continue to believe that we need more diverse intersex stories out there in the mainstream news and entertainment media to start impacting more hearts and minds and ultimately leading to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. I now want to invite Maria Shodan, our executive director, and Ritu Parna back to the stage for a fireside chat um, between these colleagues. Please go ahead. Um, I will ask them a few questions uh, following these interventions. We'll also have time for, um, for more questions from the audience. So I want to start by uh, mentioning a couple commonalities that I noticed in the remarks by Ritu Parna and Kimberly. And one of them is that you both spoke about families as a site of violence. Um, Ritu Parna spoke about uh, physical and sexual violence from families, forced marriage, um, and Kimberly spoke about families essentially being uh, kind of manipulated into inflicting medical harm on their children. And when I think about these, these comments that you've made, I think about um, the anti-gender, anti-rights, anti-feminist movement and the insistence on a certain kind of rigid understanding of family values. I'm wondering, um, Maria, um, to start with you, as you heard Ritu Parna and Kimberly's remarks, how did you think about how we in the LGBTIQ movement should and shouldn't use framings around family? to talk about what we're doing and also to respond to, to anti-gender and anti-democratic movements? I mean, I think that is a narrative that we need to reclaim. Like, we all come from families, we all have families, and the idea that somehow the other side, if you will, are claiming that they are the only ones who have the right to talk about family. I, I often personally feel very angered by that. I have. I mean, we all have families. I have a son who is not legally my son. He's not adopted. He's not my biological son. But the idea that someone can claim mm. that he is not my son yeah. is ridiculous. I mean, it's ri as ridiculous, I think, to him as it is to me. And so I think we need to reclaim a lot of this narrative. And I love what you said, Ritu, about our chosen families. I mean, I really think that other people should learn more from us. Mm -hmm. They may not sort of think that we have much to teach them, but actually we do. Mm -hmm. Because everyone, I mean, we all know there are lots of families that are dysfunctional. Like everyone <laughs> could, could need a chosen family if their uh, families of origin don't, you know, don't function the way that mm -hmm. you know, people deserve to have their families work. So I really think that there is a narrative that we need to reclaim mm -hmm. and spread. And I hate the idea that people with a very patriarchal, old fashioned view of families uh, should, should be the only ones talking about that. Mm -hmm. Ritu Parna and Kimberly, I wonder if you can talk about that question a little bit more. I mean, Ritu Parna, I only learned recently, actually, when we were preparing for this event about the substance of your intervention before the, the Supreme Court of India and the insistence on chosen family. Um, if this is not something that we are going to get from the courts, how do we as a movement advocate for this more generally in society? And I guess my question for Kimberly related to this is, how have you worked with intersex children um, or adults um, who are seeking to kind of address and, and reconcile with violence that they see their families as having been a site of. And what does that process look like? What does reclaiming or, or finding alternative chosen family look like for intersex people? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't know if the court will like grant this chosen family idea because it's very radical for them to think that a couple of people will decide what it is. But for us, you know, like a one romantic sexual partner cannot decide that that 
they will pull the plug that only one person will decide that they will pull the plug when I am about to like die. That's a totally too much of a burden for one person. Mm -hmm. And it's too much of a burden for one person to take care of all my mental, emotional, physical needs. And that's why we need chosen family. Like at least you also have lots of like, you know, things to be taken care of. And that's how we st have started talking about chosen families in our trainings also with, with women's movements. And, and, and also chosen family as collective care, which is very, very important. And, and, and I've grown up in indigenous society and indigenous societies actually is, is, is sort of a chosen family. My, my parents didn't have to hire a nanny because I grew up, I don't know where, my parents didn't know where I grew up because it was, <laughs> It was a village where I grew up and no one knew where I grew up. Um, then my parents had to find me. That the whole indigenous culture where it is, it is actually modernity which is making us very individualist, very like two people centric. But if you actually go back to our roots and our indigenous roots, which actually talks about chosen family very well. Um, and, and, and therefore in our workshops, in our advocacy efforts, we have to talk about, we have to make people realize we all have chosen families, right? Our friends, think about our friends. What do they do for us? Like what have they not done for us? In our, in our, in our, in our health, during our health, they look after our pets, they, they, they look after us when we are sad, they are there, they, they're there to provide us foods. When during COVID they provided us foods, they don't, care about being being unwell also. I think we have to talk about chosen family in that way. And so that there's greater recognition. And it's not only for queer people, you know, it's also for single women who choose not to get married. And it, it will be so helpful for all those perverts to come together and challenge the mainstream, which is very, very little. Kimberly. Yeah, um, my mind is racing with thoughts right now as I'm, as I'm listening. Um, I think one thing that I think is a little bit unique for the for the uh, intersex community is that at least the, the gender-based violence that's happening, usually in medical settings, um, is happening at such a young age, and it's happening before children really have a voice at all. And the decision-making about the irreversible decisions that are being made about gender and about someone's body and about even their sexuality, making assumptions about who they may want to have sex with someday are made by parents or caregivers, usually parents. And so I think this is happening so early on and putting parents in the driver's seat of such a fundamental part of someone's life is, is a little bit unique um, and, you know, compared to the rest of the community because it's happening so young. So there's a very, um, a tricky dynamic um, as intersex people grow up and start to understand what was done to them, usually with their parents thinking it's well with, you know, within their best interest, doctors, based on doctors' best advice about what would be in their best interest. Um, I think what I've seen, at least in, in, in many parts of the world, and again, my bias is definitely Western and, you know, places that have been colonized, is a fear of intersex people to speak out or be out about what happened to them because they're feeling guilty and afraid of hurting their parents because it was their parents' decision, right? So it's it's a it's a little bit different dynamic. Um, as far as chosen family goes, I think it is one of the best concepts <laughs> of our century. I think everyone should have chosen family. Um, I also think that intersex people, in my experience over the last, um, you know, decade or two, has been find each other. You know, that peer support, which I think happens in, in many of our communities. Um, that peer support, also, I'm witnessing it at a parent-to-parent -parent level, and I think a lot of good can come out of that parent parental peer support. Um, so I think a focus on on more peer support and awareness and, and uh, family support in general for the intersex community can go a long way to helping intersex persons throughout their life because these issues that happen early on 
carry forward both physically and emotionally through in, 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 in real ways over the course of someone's lifespan. Um, I, yeah, and I, and I also just want to mention that in, there are, there are parents also who seek out surgical intervention to, to fix their children um, here in the United States and all, and all around the world. Um, and there are a growing number of doctors who are feeling less comfortable with that um, here in the United States and asking, you know, and refusing to do certain surgeries that they see as cosmetic. And parents are going to the next hospital in the next state and getting it done. So this is really violence that's happening um, by parents, some of whom are more informed and some of whom are driving it. And I have to say a lot of that is coming from a variety of different family structures and cultural beliefs of their own. Um, so it's it's a lot to tackle, but I think the most hopeful part of this is um, trying to find more awareness raising and communication amongst families and also chosen family and finding that peer support outside of your biological or Family. Yeah, thank you. So I think there's a couple things emerging here. One is recognition of the family as a potential site of violence. One is the need for us to rally as a community around the idea of chosen family and the validation of chosen family. And also what you just mentioned, Kimberly, the importance of work with families, which I think LGBTQ communities have also been doing for a long time and intersex communities are doing as well. And the importance of doing that work to bring families along to where we are. Um, I want to, I have another question, but I, I'm also conscious of time and want to check if there are questions from the chat yet. Um, and I want to invite those in the chat um, to, if you do have questions, to be to be the first um, to come up. Um, I'm sorry, your microphone has moved somewhere. <laughs> um, so first, uh, a lot of kudos in the chat for both speakers. Um, one of the questions that I, th I thought was interesting for, for Kimberly is um, there's an intersex uh, representative in the chat who mentioned how they had kind of quietly left the queer movement in their country and have had, s have had s more strides that way. So I was curious about kind of the pros and cons of the intersex movement aligning itself with the queer movement and whether or not, you know, kind of what you're seeing is, is that the the right move or is there a way to kind of walk the line where you're able to continue aligning with the queer movement while still representing intersex issues? Thanks so Thank much, you. Whitney. And um, maybe I will take just one question from the room and I'm sorry, but you will have time to speak to the panelists. Um, so if someone has a, a question from the room, we would love to welcome you to the mic. Or two, if anyone feels shy about taking up the one question, we can make room for two as well. Fantastic, thank you. Hey everyone, uh, Matt Wagner with Target 10. Um, my question actually also for Kimberly, I was just kind of baffled by the comment about doctors who provide trans affirming care then going and kind of seeming to do the opposite and, and work with intersex parents looking to do things that we, we don't necessarily agree with. Can you just explain a little bit more about what the mindset is there and how and why that happens? Thank you so, for, so much for that. And on top of that, I'm going to add my last question, which I'll direct more to Maria and to Ritu, I think since there's a couple of questions for Kimberly, um, although also I think you can speak to the first question about intersex and LGBTQ movements working together as well. My last question really, and it relates to the first question, is around the issue of allyship. And given that two of the issues that emerged from both Ritu and Kimberly's interventions were about gender-based violence, naming what happens to our communities as gender-based violence, and around bodily autonomy, does kind of identifying our issues in these terms create opportunities for more alliances with others outside of our communities who are working on these issues in the same way? Um, so we'll go to Kimberly first, um, then to Maria, and then to Ritu. I'm Great. sorry, I have a question. Um, is it not to cut you short? My name is Tato Muruti. I am part of the LGBTI community 
um, organization in Botswana, Southern Africa. Well, my question is around family support. Um, in Botswana specifically, we've had a case where a mother was really standing for their intersex child. And what we've seen is that local doctors are also quite interested in ensuring that we empower families to stand up for their own children who are intersex and um, in some cases transgender. So I wanted to know how do we ensure that we bring into alignment support for family, um, support for family at um, policy level and also at clinical level. Thank you so much for that, Papa. So um, mobilizing support for family um, question on queer and, uh, and intersex communities or movements working together or working separately. Um, and then the question around uh, kind of the different medical models, Kimberly, um, if you can answer those all rather quickly. <laughs> um, then we'll sure. The next no problem. Um, yes, uh, to quickly answer the gender-based violence uh, framework and movement as an opportunity for advancing the intersex rights movement, 100%. And I think we're starting to see that in various places globally. And that's a place where there can be more collaboration that is not necessarily uh, LGBTQ, it's more expansive and broader. Um, regarding working for interest, you know, advancing intersex human rights from within an LGBTQ or queer framework, um, that is that is a big question that the movement has been asking, and not everyone in the intersex agrees with the answer. I can give you my answer, which is I think we need everyone, and I think it does need to be a part of the broader movement. But there's a caveat to that, and the caveat is something I spoke to in my comments about needing to be open-minded to also work intersectionally with other movements, and sometimes that might be that might mean downplaying our queerness, if you will, while focusing on children's rights. And that, that's not an easy thing to ask of everyone. But that is something I think, you know, even the Special Envoys Office at the State Department, where I just came from, has recognized in doing this work, um, you really need to take the lead of people on the ground. And my experience has been very often, there are intersex people who are also queer and are doing this work for example, under a children's rights framework instead, um, because that's what is needed in that particular political environment. And then the last question, I wish I had an answer for why trans, uh, you know, trans affirming doctors um, are also doing these surgeries on intersex children. This has been going on for years. Um, I don't have the answer to that. I think we could have a discussion, you know, that would be longer than this time allows around why that might be. But it, it's it's definitely um, partly an educational process, partly it's politics, you know, partly it's the medical industrial complex and how it operates. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, Maria, your thoughts on gender-based violence, bodily autonomy, or any of the other questions raised? I mean, I think in terms of allyship, I mean, I think our movements, we need all the allies. We need to be allies and we need others to be allies to us. And I think what we have to realize is that we can be allies and we can have allies even if we don't have exactly the same opinions about every single thing. And I think we have to look at working with allies on the issues where we can align and then maybe not go into everything where we don't necessarily align. And I think that that's the best way to sort of broaden broaden our work, bring more people in. And also, I think we have to recognize that not everyone is going to have all the knowledge. Like, I constantly meet people who get nervous as soon as I say LGBTIQ. They're, they, you can see how they get nervous because they are afraid that they don't know enough about every single letter to engage. And I think we have to look at allies as the people that we can bring in and we're going to learn from them. They're going to learn from us. And we can move things along. And we have to show up. We're asking them to show up. We also have to show up. Yeah. I think one of the biggest examples I would like to give of allyship is the women's movement of our country. And for the longest time, we've been forcing, like actually forcing. And, and also because it's our natural ally. We feel like women's movement is our natural ally. Um, not the LGBTQI movement, but LBQ organizing because it's 
that's how we are feminist, queer feminist activist. So, uh, and it so happened that because Nazaria has been involved in also the shelter home network and also the domestic violence network. And what happened is that it's so beautiful that the domestic violence network has, has organizations around the country, so many organizations, and they changed their mission and vision to include um, queer women and trans persons. And the mission and vision now clearly says queer women and trans persons, they are like, we know, but we need to be educated more. And, um, and, uh, and also, uh, when I say queer women and trans persons, they, they, uh, they clearly want to know more about uh, intersex surgeries as well, because that's what's been happening in many, many uh, parts of our country, because they do not know about intersex, but what happens is that people with intersex variation, but, but what happens is that uh, many women um, who, who do not get menstruation or do not have menstruation do not get, are not get, do not get married. They, so they, they, they'll ask if you have menstruation or not. So they, they, they will not ask for marriage. So it, it, it clearly links to the whole idea of the right body, proper body, what body a woman should have. So we, so that's how they're connecting the idea of the proper body of a woman and all. The second thing is about the shelter home network. The shelter home network, uh, we are the only queer feminist organization, rest are all women's organization. And for the first time in the, in the, in the Indian Association of Women's Studies conference that happened recently, they said we are going to present a paper on the absence of shelter home for queer women and trans person in the gender-based violence team. And we didn't propose it. It's the, it's the, it's the, uh, yeah, it's the center that proposed it. And we were like, wow, we didn't have to work at all. And they're like, no, and, and why don't you go, you go and someone else also will go. They will present, but, but you, you become the focal point. And in the module, we have an entire section on gender sexuality and uh, LBQ persons is not just one chapter, but it's part of the entire thing. That's what allyship and gender-based violence, and, but it needs a lot of work. They will make mistakes, <coughs> just the way we will make mistakes. We make mistakes, we are not perfect, but we will have to be open to, to you know, to be patient and teaching and, and just not be bound with like labels as LGBT, but to be talking in terms of continuum and things like that. And we also part of the progressive movements and in progressive movements, without talking about queer issues, nothing happens. So yes, it's been a difficult journey. It's still happening, but the allyship, we also need to show as Maria is saying. Um, yeah, we also need to, so I just want to talk about this transgender, why, why doctors do trans surgeries and not thing, and that intersex uh, uh, surgeries. I think it's also the fact that our government also confused intersex people with trans people. And that's why the law was framed. Um, the, the, the transgender person's protection of um, rights law was framed. They, they, they thought trans people are intersex people. And uh, one is this. The second thing is also because um, capitalism and, and the medical institutions work hand in hand. Okay. If the government gave free health and if it was a welfare state, this wouldn't have happened if, because it's a private health institution. Yeah, there's money to be made off of uh, mutilating people's bodies, um, yeah. mutilating interse yeah. intersex children's bodies. Um, thank you so much to the panelists. Um, thank you for elevating the voices of parts of our movement who are not heard enough. Um, and Ritu, thank you so much for ending us off on a couple positive stories of inclusion.